In our city, hopelessness hides on every street corner, in every alley, and in our neighborhoods, hopelessness is hiding. The average person can last 40 days without food, about four days without water, roughly four minutes without air, but cannot last four seconds without hope. What can you do when you run out of hope? In a world filled with distress, desperation, and despair, where can hope be found? The message of Easter is that hope has risen from the dead. I want to say happy Easter to those of you joining us today from The Loft. We're so glad to have you guys with us. And for those of you around the world watching us on the internet, thank you for being with us as well. Now, for the past 2,000 years, the followers of Christ have greeted each other with an ancient greeting. We want to show that greeting to you today and practice it together. So the ancient greeting goes like this. They say, Christos Aneste, Alithos Aneste. Christos Aneste means Christ has risen. Alithos aneste means he's risen indeed. So I'll do the call and you do the response. Let's practice that greeting together. Christos aneste. Awesome. One more time. Christos aneste. Awesome. That's beautiful. Thank you guys for being with us. 2.2 billion people. Think about it. 2.2 billion people over this weekend will gather together and celebrate Easter. 2.2 billion. That's a third of the world's population celebrating Easter. Easter. Why? Well, because when Christ rose from the grave on Easter, it changed everything. Think about time. Time itself has been divided into two, A.D. and B.C., before Christ and Anno Domini, in the year of our Lord, the risen Jesus Christ. Every time you write the date, you reference the risen Jesus Christ. In fact, think of it this way. Every book in every library references the risen reality of Jesus Christ by the date under which it's cataloged. Books that deny Jesus, books that dismiss Jesus, still recognize the reality of the resurrection because of the date under which they are cataloged. The resurrection of Jesus, my friends, changed everything. And today I want to talk with you about what can change for you this Easter. And today's talk is titled, Hope Rises. Hope rises. If you have a Bible, turn to 1 Peter chapter 1. That's way back where the letters are, 1 Peter 1. If you do not have a Bible, no worries at all. We're going to put everything up on the screen so we can follow along together. We want to move through the message together. I do want to encourage you to take notes. So if you like the old-fashioned method in front of you, you should find a piece of paper in the seat back with a pen. Please take it out. Take some notes. If you have a smartphone and you have the YouVersion Bible app, you can look up the live event, Colonial Church. Our notes should be there. We'd love to be able to move through the message together uh, by that. So... As we begin, by show of hands, how many of you know someone who has been to a funeral sometime in the past 12 months? Can I see your hand, someone? That's pretty much almost all of us. Culturally speaking, Easter has become really a matter of colored eggs and candy. That's how we think of it, like kid stuff. It's just a matter of colored eggs and candy. But biblically speaking, Easter is not a matter of colored eggs and candy. Biblically speaking, Easter is a matter of life and death. Heard about a young pastor who was asked to do a funeral for a homeless guy who died but had no friends or family to be there. So he agreed to do the funeral, but it was way out in the country, and he got lost trying to find his way there. So he showed up about an hour late, and as he pulled up, the hearse was gone. There was just a backhoe and a crew standing around eating lunch. So he went over to the crew, and he apologized for being late and assured them that what they were about to do together is the right thing to do. And So he gathered them around that grave, and he realized it was half-filled anyway, and He's like, oh, man, so he, so he prayed. And when he got done praying, he started to preach a funeral message. Man, he preached his heart out from Genesis to Revelation, made in the image of God in and, and Genesis, and we will see him face to face, Revelation. And as he's going, he's all fired up. The workers started to get kind of fired up. So they're like, amen, praise God, glory. And they're getting all stirred up. And when he concluded his long sermon, he prayed. And after his prayer, he walked back to his car with a sense of purpose that he had done the right thing. As he was getting in the car, he was taking off his jacket to get in. He overheard one of the workers in the distance say, Man, I ain't never seen anything like that before. And I've been installing septic tanks for 20 years. <laughs> Easter, 
It's a matter of life and death. Here's a serious thought. One day, you will be the next person on this planet to die. One day, you will be next. Then what? Our prayer this Easter for you, and we have been praying for you, we have been praying all week long for you. Our prayer for you this Easter is that you will have an answer for then what? If you're taking notes, you can write this down. Here's our big idea for today. You can write it down. Jesus left an empty tomb in order to fill an empty heart. Jesus left an empty tomb in order to fill an empty heart. Let me ask you a question. What's, what's the greatest fear that people have? Like if you look at the list of phobias and fears and all that kind of stuff, there's always one right at the top. It's like the greatest one. The greatest fear people can have is the fear of death. We all fear death, every one of us. Um, the fear of death is so prevalent that we actually begin to mock death. We're so kind of afraid of it. We, we speak of death jokingly, and we actually mock death. When somebody dies, we say that they're taking a dirt nap. When somebody has uh, died, we say they're, they're just pushing up daisies, or we'll say that they are at room temperature. Uh, here's one. When somebody dies, we say that they've joined the choir invisible. When someone dies, we say that they've gone into the fertilizer business. It's a good one. When someone dies, we say that they have become a root inspector. And someone who dies, we might even say that they are blinking for an exceptionally long period of time. Death, we fear death. And so we mock death. We speak of it jokingly because we fear it. One Easter at a church, they were doing their kids' sermon, and the kids' pastor had all the kids gathered together, and he asked them the question. What were Jesus' first words to his disciples on Easter? And the kids couldn't remember. And then one of them was like, oh, oh, I remember. And so she stands up and says, Jesus' first words to his disciples on Easter were, (laughs) ta-da. It's a pretty good answer, actually. That's pretty good. But it's a really good question. What were Jesus' first words to his disciples on Easter? It had to be like, what? I mean, what were his first words? Here they are. In John chapter 20 and verse 19, his first words to his disciples, peace to you. His first words at the empty tomb to Mary after he said greetings, his first words, Matthew 20, verse 18, or Matthew 28, verse 10, rather, he said this, do not be afraid. We fear death, but Jesus has conquered that thing we fear. He conquered death. It was D.L. Moody, who was a 19th century evangelist, who put it this way. He said, quote, death may be the king of terrors, but Jesus is the king of kings. Christ came out of the tomb so that hope might come into your life. What does the empty tomb even mean? Well, that's what we're going to look at today. Just a couple things. If you're taking notes, you can write these down. A couple things. First of all, that Jesus' empty tomb means, number one, that death is defeated. Death is is defeated. Now, everybody help me out. True or false? Death is a fact of life. True or false? It's true. It's everywhere. Every day we are confronted with the reality of death. Just think about the movies that you watch. Death all over the place. Think of the music that you hear. Death. Think of the news. Death. We even live in towns and our communities have cemeteries right there. We're like, we drive by dead people as a matter of everyday life. Life is surrounded by death, and death is a fact of life. It's a reality. And the stats on death are pretty irrefutable. One out of every one person will die. In other words, none of us getting out of here alive. I don't mean today, but I mean like <laughs> this earth. Death is how we leave this place. That's a reality, but you know, it's also finality. Death is a finality. I, I remember my first experience with the finality of death. When I was a little boy, my mom bought me a parakeet. And my sister had a cat. And the cat ate my parakeet. One day I walked in the house and the cage was open. I was like, oh, and there were feathers all over the place. And I looked and there was a cat in the corner. <laughs> I was like, no. So I ran over to the cage. There was just feathers everywhere. I was like, <laughs> so as I sifted through the feathers, I found a claw. Not a claw, a claw. I found like the whole foot of my parakeet. And I took it and I kept it. I kept it in the hopes that one day my parakeet would return. Did my parakeet return? 
No. But that dang cat would never leave. <laughs> so I kept that claw. I'm not kidding. I put it in my pocket. I carried it around for days. Yeah. A few days into it, I had to admit defeat. Death had won. And I had to give my little parakeet claw a, a bear a funeral. <laughs> My friends, when Jesus left the empty tomb, death no longer has the final word. We're in 1 Peter chapter 1, and I'm going to show you verse 3. This is our key verse for today. It says this. It says, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. According to his great mercy, he has caused us to be born again to a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. Look at your attention that word mercy right there. Notice it says, according to his great mercy. In the original language, this term mercy is alethos. Alethos is compassion. According to our text here, God is the God of great mercy, of great compassion. So well, how so? Well, here's how so. Um, newsflash. We weren't meant to die. We were not meant to die. When you go to a funeral and you're sitting there and you're grieving, like this, isn't, this is, should not be. You're right. Death should not be. When you go back to the beginning of the Bible, Genesis 1 and 2, we were not created for death. Death was nowhere in the picture. It was life. Life with God. Life with one. That's what we were meant for. But by Genesis 3, our primary parents decided to reject God's leadership, be their own God, open up the door, and allow sin and suffering and evil and death into God's good creation, thus corrupting it. And now we have death. And so God... In his great mercy, has to deal with the problem of sin and death. You say, well, how does he do it? Well, from our text right here, a couple facts jump out that I'd like to point out to you. Two facts. How does God deal with sin and death? Two facts. Fact number one, Jesus died. Fact number one was that Jesus died. Notice our text says that we were born again to a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. Jesus was dead. Here's a question. How did he die? Jesus died on the cross. Why did he die? He died, Scripture says, for our sins. Now, death and sin are joined at the hip. They're not separate. They're joined together. In fact, here's what Scripture has to say about this. Uh, Romans chapter 5 and verse 12, it says, Through one man, speaking of Adam, through one man sin entered the world, and through sin death. 1 Corinthians 15, 56 says that the sting of death, the sting of sin is Death. And then James 1 and verse 15 says, Sin, when it, it is born, brings forth death. Listen, in order to defeat death, Jesus had to deal, first of all, with our sin. In order to defeat death, he had to deal, if you want to deal with the death problem, then you got to deal with the sin problem that created the death problem. How does he do it? How does anyone deal with sin? Well, think of it this way. There's really only two ways to deal with sin. One we'll call man's way. The other we'll call God's way. Man's way looks like a balancing act. Imagine two scales that you might balance. Many of us, that's how we approach our sins. A balancing act. you got good deeds on one side and bad deeds on the other. Go, oh, I know I do bad deeds. I, we all know we do bad stuff. So what do we do with that? Well, I guess I should do more good deeds than bad deeds and hopefully outweigh the bad bad deeds, and thus I'll somehow be acceptable to God in some way. So what do we do? We, we pray, or maybe go to church, or read the Bible, or do religious things, or help old ladies across the street, social justice, charitable giving, whatever. We, we do it. Man's way, the balancing act, you can spell D-O, do. It's based on what you can do. Every religion's based on that philosophy. That's man's way to deal with sin. But it doesn't deal with sin. God's way is different. God does not deal with sin with a balancing act. God deals with sin through a canceling act. Jesus Christ, the sinless Son of God, took our sins upon himself. He had no sin. He took our sins upon himself. He paid a debt that he didn't owe because we owe a debt that we could not pay. And on the cross, he took our sins upon himself and took those down into the grave. God's way of dealing with sin is spelled D-O-N-E. Done. It's not based on what you could do. It's based on what Jesus Christ has done. The symbol of Christianity is not the balancing scales of justice. The symbol of Christianity is the cross of Jesus Christ. The place where sin was disabled. 
because sin and death go hand in hand. If God wants to deal with death, he's got to deal with sin, the thing that caused death in the first place. So fact number one is that Jesus died. Fact number two is that Jesus lives. He lives. Notice our text says that we were born again to a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Good news that Christ died for our sins, he was buried, and he rose from the grave on the third day. That's the good news. And thanks to the risen Christ, death and sin have been disabled. Now, every major figure in world history has followed the same path. They have died, they have been buried, and they're still buried. Every single one. Buddha died, 483 B.C., he was buried, and he is still buried. Muhammad died, 632 A.D. He was buried, and he is still buried. Jesus of Nazareth died. He was buried, and he rose from the grave on the third day. Heard of a Muslim man from Africa who committed his life to Christ, and his family members were horrified that he would do this. And they were asking, like, how could you do such a thing? Here was his answer. Why would you do such a thing? His answer, quote, suppose you were going down a road and it suddenly forked in two directions and you didn't know which way to go. At the fork were two men. One was dead and the other was alive. Which one would you commit your life to? Jesus left an empty tomb in order to fill an empty heart. Jesus' empty tomb means, number one, that death is defeated. But number two, if you're taking notes, Jesus' empty tomb means that hope, hope has risen. Hope has risen. Now, let's be honest together. I think the church is a good place to be honest. By show of hands, how many of you have ever been let down? You got your hopes up, and you've been painfully let down before. Can I see your hands? And so, so many of us, we, we were like really sensitive to empty promises. We're like, man, I ain't buying into any of that stuff. Why? Because we've gotten our hopes up. Maybe you hoped in money, or maybe you hoped in a job, or maybe you hoped to find that spouse. Maybe you hoped to find a career, or maybe you hoped to have a child. Maybe you hoped a relationship would occur, or maybe a friendship would develop. Now, all of those things I just mentioned have one thing in common. They can all be taken away from you. Money can be stolen. Jobs can be terminated. Family members, loved ones can die. Friends can move away. Question, then what? The most tragic death of all is the death of hope. If I can be honest with you, there's some of you here today, that describes what's happening inside of you. There's a slow dying, a slow dying of hope. Because all those things I just mentioned are happening in your life in some way, shape, or form. Why would God allow this? Here's why. French writer Georges Bernano said it this way, quote, In order to be prepared to hope in that which does not deceive, we must first lose hope in everything that does deceive. We put our hope in things, and things don't, that's not the place for our, so the things let us down. The bad news is that sometimes we hope in things that we can lose. The good news is that the risen Christ is the hope that we cannot lose, the hope that cannot die, the hope that can never be taken away from you. Let's look again in our text, 1 Peter chapter 1 and verse 3. Again, our text says, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. According to his great mercy, he's caused us to be born again to a what? He's caused us to be born again to a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. Those two words, living hope. For some of you, those two words do not connect in your life experience. Living hope, not at all. More like dying hope. There are many of us, our hopes of being loved by someone are dying. Some of us, our hopes of conquering an addiction, dying. Hopes of getting a decent job, dying. Hopes of finding peace, dying. Now, in our culture, when we say hope, we typically mean uncertainty. Well, I hope so. Well, I'm hoping. I'm hoping. We mean uncertainty. 
But from a biblical perspective, hope does not mean uncertainty. It means certainty. Let me give you an example. Before Jesus was ever crucified, he said, oh, by the way, the Son of Man will be handed over to sinful men and suffer. He will die, and he will ra- rise three days later. Two times he predicted his death before his death, and I'll give them to you. You can write them down, look them up later if you like. Luke 9, 22, Matthew 20, verse 19. What does that mean? Here's what that means. If you can predict that you're going to suffer and die and then rise from death and then you do that, chances are that's a person you can trust. Because we all fall victim to empty promises. Here's the deal. The empty tomb gives us certainty that Jesus doesn't have any empty promises for you and me. If he can say, I will suffer, die, and rise in the third day and suffer, die, and rise in the third day, there's no empty promises with this guy. In fact, What is Jesus' greatest promise? In a word, the greatest promise that Jesus makes in the Bible is one word, life. Jesus promises life. Notice in our text it says that we were born again to a living hope. This word living is a very special word, has a very unique root. In the original language in which the New Testament was written, which is Koine Greek, there are two basic words for life. First word is the word bios. We get our word biology out of that. It means physical life, just simply physical life existence. Bios. Humans can have bios. Physical, here's what it looks like. That kind of life looks like this. You get up in the morning, you go somewhere. Then later in the end of the day, you come home and maybe you eat something and then you watch TV and then you go to bed. And the next day you wake up You go somewhere, you do something, you come home, maybe eat something, watch TV, and you go to bed, you wake up, and you repeat, repeat, repeat. That is life, but according to the Bible, that's not life. That's life. That's bios. There are many of us here who think we're alive, but you're not alive. You're just existing because I just described your life. I I, I know that. I lived that one too. I, I knew that one. Get up, go to bed, and you're like, well, then what? first word for life in the Bible is bios, physical life. Here's the second word. The second word, which is the root word of this word here for living hope. It's also the word Jesus uses every time he promises life. Zoe. Z-O-E. Zoe is the life of God. The life of God, which is the life from God, which is life with God now and forever through his son, Jesus Christ. Zoe. It's the life of God poured into your life. Wow. In fact, Jesus Christ repeatedly made the claim that he can give Zoe to people. I'll quote a few for you. You can write these down look them up later. In John 5, 26, Jesus said, The Father has granted that the Son would have life, Zoe, in himself. John 14, 6, Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life, Zoe. John 17, 2, Jesus praying to the Father, You have given him, Son of Man, authority to give eternal life, Zoe. In fact, let's just read one together. Here's my favorite one. Favorite promise of Jesus of life. Here it is. Put up on the screen. John 11, 25 and 26. Jesus said to her. Everybody read out loud when we get there. Here we go. Jesus said to her, I am the resurrection and the? Whoever believes in me, though he die, yet shall he? And everyone who? And believes in me shall never? Do you believe this? Do you believe this? Have you traded your bios for his Zoe? Have you given your bios to Jesus so he can give Zoe to you? Now let me give you the context of that promise we just read, John 11, 25, 26. It's a funeral. It's a funeral of a friend. His name is Lazarus. Here's your homework. Go, go at some point this weekend, read John chapter 11. Read the whole chapter. Jesus had three very close friends, very cl- closer than the 12. Mary, Martha, and their brother Lazarus. Lazarus is sick, and then he dies. Jesus shows up late. They're bummed out. It's a funeral. Jesus makes this promise. Oh, I'm the resurrection and the life. Whoever lives and believes in man, they never die. Whoever believes in me, it's, man, it's, I'm the resurrection. And guess what he did? He turned right around, and he raised Lazarus from the dead, right in front of not just friends and family and the, and the mourners from the funeral, but in front of the very Pharisees and enemies that he had and the religious leaders of the day. He raised Lazarus from the dead right in front of everybody. 
It's one thing to say, oh, I'm the resurrection. It's another thing to turn right. Say it at a funeral. I want to be honest with you. It took a funeral for me to find life in Christ. Some of you know my story. Many of you don't. I'm not from a religious upbringing. I was raised in an unchurched home, a broken home. My dad left when I was four. I had three older sisters. My mom's a severe alcoholic. We grew up in that environment. I was a drug dealer, death metal drummer at the age of uh, 22 years old. I'd come off the road and I'd come home and I was hanging out with some friends in the studio. And there's a friend of mine and, and uh, his name is Rick. And so we're in the studio, we're out in, like in the garage, and we're, we're getting high, just goofing around. And, and right in the middle of getting high, Rick's like, out of nowhere, he's like, I don't know why people don't believe in Jesus. It's like they divided time over the guy. And I'm like, what? Where did that come from? Two weeks later, Rick was dead. Rick was a heroin addict. And we all knew that. We watched him pass out. Heroin addicts black out. Rick was a house painter. He was three stories up painting a house on the outside, and he blacked out. And I remember thinking, if I'd have told Rick right there in the garage, two weeks later, man, you're going to be dead, we both would have laughed. What a joke. There I was two weeks later sitting at a funeral for Rick. And I remember. I remember all the metal heads and all these other dudes around me at this funeral, all knew the right moves at the right time. They could all pray the right prayer out loud together. And I didn't know anything. And I had one overwhelming thought. Here it is. One day, I too will suddenly die. Then what? At that time, there was a friend that I played music with for years. He calls me out of the blue. Turns out he'd become a follower of Christ, one of those dudes. And he calls me up, say, I got a buddy, we want to come and just, you know, chat with you. I'm like, whatever. So they come over to my house. And their goal was like, reach out to Jim. For the first time in my life, they talked about Jesus in any way that I've ever remembered understanding in any way. And all they really did was point at a Bible verse. Romans 10, 9. If you confess with your mouth, Jesus is Lord, you believe in your heart, God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. Would you like, hey, have you ever done that? I'm like, uh, no. They're like, do you want to do that? I'm like, in my mind, I'm like, no. And I was like, yes. <laughs> I have no idea. I, I have, to this day, I have no idea. September 26, 1990, I bowed my head in my house. And I prayed a simple prayer. And 1 Peter 1, 3 happened to me. I'm not from here. I don't belong here. I'm from far away. How did I get here? 1 Peter 1, 3 happened to me. I was born again to a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus from the dead. So let me ask you, one day you will be the next person on this planet to die. Then what? Every day, you pitch your tent one day closer to that moment, every day. And one day, you will step out of this world and into another. Then what? One time, there was a college student, and he was talking to an older, wiser man about his life plan. And he said, I'm getting a degree. And the wise man said, then what? So I'm going to start a business. And the wise man said, then what? So I'm going to make a fortune. And the wise man said, then what? I said, well, I'm going to grow old and live off my money, you know, retire, take it easy. And the old man said, then what? And the college student said, I, I don't know, die, I suppose. And the older man asked him the greatest question of all. He said, then what? A wise man once said, the fool is the man whose plans end at the grave. Let's pray together. 
God, we say thank you for sending your son, the sinless son, Jesus Christ, who went to the cross, taking all of our sin and all of our shame upon himself so that we might trade in our shame for your forgiveness. Thank you for the risen Christ who defeated death so that we might have a living hope right here, right now, that can never be stolen, lost, or taken away because our hope is the person of Jesus Christ. With heads bowed and with eyes closed, there's some of you here today that the truth is you're without Christ. You're on your own. You've been going your own way, doing your own thing, and God loves you and he brought you here today because he wants to give you hope. There's some of you here today, you can't look to a moment in your life, that moment where you, where you opened your life to Christ and, and received him into your life. So as a result, he's not in you. You do not belong to him. You are on your own. And as a result, you're not right with God and maybe, maybe, maybe you're tired today. Maybe you're lonely today. Maybe you're angry today. Or maybe you're empty today. And you wonder why God allowed all of your hopes to be dashed all through your life. Here's why. So that you might lose hope in everything that deceives. So that you might find hope in the one thing that does not deceive. The Lord Jesus Christ. If you're here today, you need to realize you didn't get here by accident. God brought you here because he loved you. And he wants to give you hope. And hope has a name. His name is Jesus. And if you open your life to Christ, he will come into your life and he will bring a new hope. And he'll make you a new person. And things begin right here and right now. If you are here and you sense that you are not right with God, and maybe you're ready to be, getting right with God is as simple as A, B, C. A, admit that you're a sinner and you need a Savior. And B, to believe that, that Christ died on the cross for your sins, that he rose from the grave to give you new life, and then see to call upon him. Scripture says whoever calls upon Jesus will be saved. That means forgiven. That means that God's spirit will come into your life and make you alive and give you zoe, and you will have hope, and nobody can ever take it away from you. For just as surely as Jesus has risen, you will rise with him. If you're here today in your prayers, Christ, I need you. I want you, Jesus. I open my life to you. Jesus, save me. Jesus, come into my life. That's your prayer. Raise your hand right now. Just lift it up. Go ahead, all of you around the room. Those, that's your prayer. Christ, I need you. I want you. I'm calling on you. Just lift your hand. Go ahead and lift it up. Hands going up all around the room. Those of you in the loft, if that's your prayer, lift your hand right now. Saying, Christ, I need you. I want you. Go ahead and lift it up and keep it up. Those of you online, if that's your prayer, Jesus, save me. Heal me. Forgive me. Be my Savior and leader. Lift your, just lift your hand right here, right now. We can pray together. Right where you sit, you can just say, Dear God, I need you. I'm a sinner and I'm a Savior or need a Savior. And Jesus, I believe that you are the Son of God, that you died for my sins and that you rose from the grave. And right now I'm asking you to forgive all my sins, to come into my life, to fill me with your Spirit and to make me new. Thank you for forgiveness and thank you for new life. It is in your name that I pray and everyone said, amen and amen. Let's celebrate together. Awesome. Yeah, God.